Hi again. And by again, I mean the first time for you, but I've already made this video. I posted it, everything was great, and then I realized my mic wasn't plugged in. So hopefully you can hear me this time. I'll try not to go too fast since it's my second time around, but um, we're back. We, are, we just finished um, our chapter one and two test, uh, partial fractions, rational functions, lots of functions. Um, we're not quite leaving functions yet. We're going to learn about a new type of function and um, how it works and the ins and outs and the applications of it. So without further ado, um, let's learn about what we call the exponential function. So um, here is an exponential function. We call exponential functions transcendental functions. Transcendental meaning not a polynomial. And normally that makes more sense because we would have done a polynomial section, but because you guys did them in Algebra 2, um, we skipped the polynomial section. But here it is, the transcendental function, uh, anything that's not a polynomial, we have this exponential function which says the output is equal to some number raised to the x power. Um, that number has to be bigger than zero, so we're not talking negative numbers. If it's a negative number, it's something different. Um, but if it's a number bigger than zero, not one, it's called exponential. Um, why wouldn't one work? Like, we're talking exponential growth. If one was the base, we'd have one to the first power, one to the second power, one to the third power. And that would just be a constant. That would always be one. So it can't be one. Anything positive, we are talking exponential function. Um, that A we'll call our base. We raise it to the exponent or we raise it to the power. So just some vocab words for us there. And let's take a look at it. So here's a picture of it. This is called exponential growth. Anytime the base is any number bigger than 1, 7, 12, 1.015, we would experience exponential growth. This function right here is y to the uh, 2 to the x power, y equals 2 to the x power. We would call that a doubling function. Hopefully you can see why. A doubling function, this is 2 to some power, means multiply by 2 over and over and over. Well, that's what it means to double something, multiply by 2. Um, a couple features here. The domain. The domain is all real numbers. Up here in our equation, there's not a number you can't plug in. You can plug in any number you want. You want to plug in a 10? Fine. You want to plug in a 2? Fine. You want to plug in a negative 6? Fine. But for the range, when you plug those numbers in, 2 to the 10th, big. 2 to the 2nd, small. 2 to the negative 3rd. Small, 2 to the negative 100, really small, how about 2 to the negative 5th, small. It's never negative. Notice all those numbers in there, it doesn't matter what you plug in for x, 2 to some power will always be a positive number. Well, that's telling me my range are all numbers greater than 0. Well, that's the definition of a horizontal asymptote. It's going to get really, really close to 0, the bigger a negative number I put in here but it's never actually going to hit zero. We, we learned about those. Here it is in interval notation. And then we get this number called the, well, I call it the pin. I think of it as like a tack. Um, if I plug in a zero, anything to the zero power is one, so that's my y-intercept. But as we start moving this around, right, with reflections and translations, and I, I can move this. I just like to think of picking up the tack, moving it up, down, wherever, and then sticking it back down, and all the whole function goes with it. Um, it's just an easy one to keep up with. Plugging in a zero is a piece of cake. Okay, moving on again. How about if A is not bigger than one, right? It's still positive, any positive number is exponential, but if A is a number less than, than one, between zero and one, like a half, a third, 0.2, we get something called exponential decay. And exponential decay is exactly what it sounds like. Um, in this case, it would be getting cut in half over and over and over. Um, some applications. How about the half-life? You've heard of half-life maybe in your chemistry classes or biology classes, but even medication. If you look on the side of medicine bottles, sometimes they'll tell you what their half-life are. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for there to be half as much in your system, and it follows an exponential decay model. So you take the medicine, there's that much in your system, and then after a little while it gets cut in half, and after a little while it gets cut in half, and pretty soon there's virtually... No that none of that medication in your system, right? It's going to get closer and closer to zero, but never quite get there. But for our purposes, um, we're going to eventually there'll be no medicine in your system. Okay. Um, this and this are the exact same function, right? If we raise something to the negative power, that's just like flipping the base upside down. So these are the same. Putting a negative up here is the same thing as um, having a fraction in here, something less than one. 
Um, same thing with the domain and range. You can plug in any number you want, so the domain is all real numbers. The range has to be only positive numbers, right? Any number you plug in here for x, it will always kick out something positive, so our range is from 0 to infinity. And we still have our same pin. If I plug in 1 half to the 0 power, I'll still get 1. So I still have my same tack that I can move around. Okay? Moving on. I want to sketch a graph of 2 to the x power minus 3. So think about stuff we did last unit with stuff we just talked about now. We merge the two in a delicious math sandwich, and we sketch a graph. Okay, we're back. Here's the graph. This is what it would look like. A couple of things. Um, if I just had y equals 2 to the x power by itself, there's always a horizontal asymptote at 0. But if I tack on a minus 3 to the end of it, everything gets moved down 3, including that horizontal asymptote. So that horizontal asymptote that was at 0 is now at negative 3. Easy. How about the y-intercept? Here, the y-intercept was 0, 1. We just talked about that. That was our tack but I'm going to subtract 3 off of my y values. All right, we learned about that with our transformations. So now the y-intercept becomes 0, negative 2. Finally then, I just plugged in the easy point. All of this, you could just plug in easy points. Um, 1, 2, 3. I happen to plug in a 1, and I got 1, comma, negative 1, just to see the curvature. Is it exponentially growing really, really fast? Is it growing not quite as fast? Is it somewhere in the middle? Doing an extra point helps me see that curvature, how fast is that thing growing? And if I needed more points, I could do more points. Okay. Next, we get something new I want to just show you guys. It's called Euler's number. Euler's number is an irrational number, so it's a decimal that goes on forever. Um, just like pi, think of pi. As I was, sometimes we call it a transcendental number, but um, it's an irrational number. Um, it's equal to something about that, 2.7182. You get the idea. Um, it happens in banking a lot with um, putting money in a bank account and then accruing interest, and we will talk about that in a little bit and giving you money back. Um, we call it the natural base. You'll see why we call it the natural base here in a little bit, but here it is as a base. Y equals e to the x power it looks pretty much like the other exponential growth. It is exponential growth because my base is a number bigger than 1. Um, it's going to grow exponentially. So let's do some applications with this stuff. Why, why am I learning exponential growth? The more um, things we can stack in there in your brain that you can attach it to other things in real life, the firmer it is in place and you'll be able to learn it. So um, let's talk interest. Um, we have interest in banks. You put your money into a bank and occasionally the bank will say thank you. They'll say thank you by giving you a bonus and adding money to your account. Wow. Just to have your money stashed away somewhere, they will increase it. Not by a lot. Don't be crazy. And we'll do some problems, and I'll show you that. But um, more money is always better money. So um, we'll start with something called simple interest. Simple interest is not exponential growth. Simple interest is a one-time thing. How much is in your account will be equal to the principal amount, that's how much there was to start with, times 1 plus the interest rate times how long it's sitting there. So we want to do interest in three years, how much would it be? Every year we're going to give you the same amount of money. How much would there be at the end of three years? We would plug in a three there. This would just be linear growth. It's giving you the same amount every year. Um, but again, this formula will tell me how much is in the account after three years. This would be a straight line. This one now, this is called a compound interest. Compound interest works this way. They're going to look at your account every so, off, every so often and say, wow, you have some money in our account. Here, let us give you a bonus. And then they look again and they say, wow, there's even more money in your account, right? Because they gave you a bonus last time. So we're going to give you an even bigger bonus. And then they look at it again and say, wow, there's even more. So we're going to give you even a bigger bonus. So the more you have in your account, the bigger the bonus they give you. The bigger bonus they give you, the more you have in your account. And pretty soon you don't have a straight line worth of growth. You have what we call exponential growth. The more there is, the more they add. The more they add, the more there is. And this thing will shoot off to the atmosphere and we'll all become billionaires, right? Yeah, not quite. But this is how they compound your interest. This is how they figure out how much is in your account. Or if you have some kind of investment. Or working the other way, if you owe interest on a credit card. The more you owe, the more interest they're going to charge you extra. The more extra they charge you, the more you're going to owe. So that's why you always have to pay your credit cards fast. Otherwise, you're going to have to owe more and more money. Um, so how this works. How much is in your account is equal to the principal amount. Again, how much to start with. The interest rate. Both these interest rates, by the way, you have to write as decimals. 
If the interest rate was 2%, you would write it as 0 0.02. If it was 20%, it would just be 0 0.2. 15% would be 0 0.15. You have to divide it by 100 to turn it to a percent. And then finally, this N thing. N stands for how many times a year they're going to look at your account and add money to it. So if it said in your fine print of your bank account that they're going to accrue interest daily, that means they're going to look at it 365 times a year. So N would be 365. If they do it quarterly, that means they do it four times a year. N would be four. Monthly, 12. Biannually, twice. You get the idea. And then T is how many years have, have gone by. Finally, then, we get this new one. It's called continuous compound interest. So it's still compound interest. They're looking at your account. They're adding. But we call it continuous compound interest. Um, I call it PERT for obvious reasons. It's P e to the rt power there's that e we talked about euler's number um, t is how many years r is the interest rate everything else is the same take a minute if you need to hit pause write this stuff down we'll do one practice problem and then i'll send you on your merry way all right last problem let's put it all together let's use this little applications piece so um, you put fifteen thousand dollars in some account for five years that gives you seven percent interest how much will be in the account, A, we're just jamming stuff on our calculator here, if the interest is simple? Use that formula, simple interest. What about if it's compounded monthly? Compound interest. What about if it's compounded continuously, right, PERT? Use these three formulas, rip them through your calculator, and make sure you can handle that and get the same numbers I get. Hit pause, go. Pause is undone. Here we go. Simple interest. A equals one plus, or A equals P. 1 plus R is a decimal times T, 5 years. We jam in our calculator. Uh, we have a good little return on investment after 5 years. That's, that's okay. Um, what about if it's compounded monthly? Once every month, they look at your account, they add to it. Once a month, they look at your account, add to it. Keep going, keep going. How much would there be after 5 years? Putting these numbers in. Uh, more than before. Not a lot more, but more. Any more is good, right? We talked about that. And then finally, continuous. I like to think of continuous as that little ticker as you have a countdown to like New Year's um, where it's just continually going. The numbers are always moving. Your account, not just monthly, maybe um, hourly. And then by the minute and by the second and even faster. So continuously your money is accruing interest and getting um, fractions of a cent added to your account over and over and over. In this case, a little bit more. Any more is good more. Um, I would like you guys... Uh, we'll talk about the rounding. Be careful with the rounding. With things like this, when we're raising stuff to the 60th power, rounding this uh, and cutting decimals off is going to affect your answer. You need to be very careful with that. I suggest not rounding, leaving it all in, typing it all at once, and hitting enter to get the most accurate answer. Here's your guy's stamp for the second time. Man, I hope the volume worked this time. There's your stamp. I'm stamping Monday. Um, go ahead and email me any questions. Keep working hard in here. This train is still a moving. Peace.